Hi, folks. It's Denise Howell, and you're wanted dead or alive. Whether you want to talk about Bon Jovi or the Vancouver riots, we've got you covered. We're also going to talk about a new form of liability under the DMCA and lots and lots about the music industry and iTunes match next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 116, recorded June 17, 2011. Slippery when web. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. Your free 30-day trial is waiting for you at netflix.com slash twit. Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in in Law. Uh, Let me start that again. This Week in Wall? It's a little backwards. Five, four, three, two. Hi, everyone. It's Denise Howell, and you've joined us for This Week in Law. Start your web-driven media entertainment device, because we're here to try and tell you and unpack for you the most important developments in the legal world that might affect it and everything else you do with technology. So we've got a great panel this week. We've got Neelai Patel back on the show. Hello, Neelai. Hey, guys. How's it going? Going great. Wonderful to see you again. I understand you're podcasting elsewhere this afternoon, too. Yeah, tonight, uh, the, the This Is My Next podcast will be on at 6.30 tonight, Eastern. Great, so. perfect. We're, so we're we a day late. We moved into our offices in New York today, or this week, so we're a little late, but we'll be on today. Congratulations. Usually I don't like to compete with you, Denise. I like to let you have your own day. Oh, you know, we can just sort of flow the one into the other, so. Absolutely. Glad, glad to have you guys uh, joining us later, too. And uh, with us today as well is Evan Brown. Hi, Evan. Hey, how's it going? Happy Friday to you. Happy Friday to you as well. Uh, We're going to have a a fourth panelist coming on shortly. That's David O'Brien from Technically Legal. But we are having our own share of technical issues. And uh, David's actually working on a Supreme Court brief. So those things have coincided to make him the last person to join our Motley crew today. But we will have him coming on shortly. Uh, Before we get to him, I'd like to get to some copyright issues to start off the show. Um, We talked about iTunes Match last week, and I felt like we were just getting warmed up. So I don't want to leave that one alone. I don't want to stop chewing on that just yet. Um, So I'd like to uh, bring it out again. Um, It seems kind of funny to be talking about something that we won't even get to experience firsthand until fall, but that's Apple for you. Uh, Announce and let people cogitate, and uh, then we'll get to kick the tires on it somewhere down the road. Uh, But one thing, one uh, uh, organization that has decided not to let Um, anybody kick the tires on it as far as they're concerned, is an independent music label known as Numero Uno, uh, or just Numero. Uh, And they, um, Numero Group, they're based in Chicago, uh, close to Evan. And they've uh, gone public with the fact that although Apple has paid a good deal to the record labels, the big four record labels, um, in exchange for being able to have the right to locker the music centrally and deliver it to people on whatever Apple device they choose, um, they, they are not doing so well by the independent labels. And uh, this partic- there's a great piece by Chris Forsman over at Ars Technica where he interviewed the head of that label and his name is Rob Sevier, and uh, he has asked him a bunch of questions about why they've opted out of iTunes Match, and uh, the crux of it is it's just not going to pay their artists enough money. So, you know, maybe that doesn't matter to so many people. Maybe all they want is major record music, but it uh, it is an interesting little twist, um, and it's something that Bob left Left Sets has brought up as well that uh, the artists are really kind of getting the raw end of the deal here. Eli, any thoughts on this? You know, it's, uh, that that question about the artists getting the raw end of the deal, um, I, I always find it really interesting because, you know, 
traditionally the, the record label is the one that's supposed to pay the artist, not the consumer, right? And we, you know, there's this disintermediation the internet has caused where now it feels like we should just be paying the artist directly. But, you know, what Numero does is they do what the record label is supposed to do. They take the music, in this case, old music that people have forgotten about, they repackage it, they remarket it, they do all of these services in the middle that an artist can't really afford to do on their own. Um, and they, they're kind of expecting to get paid for it. I mean, I, I don't know that Numero is really looking out for the artists. In a lot of the cases with their catalog, these artists are dead, right? They're looking out for themselves and, and what they provide to this music in the past they've bought the licenses to. So I feel like it's almost a red herring what, the, what their argument is. Oh, this isn't going to pay the artists very much. They're saying we're not going to get paid for what we're doing. And, you know, this quote, uh, we'd rather the LP or the CD be the backup and not the cloud. I mean, that thinking is... that. That, that makes you a dinosaur, right? Um, you know, nobody wants the CD to be their backup anymore. I, the biggest problem with Amazon and others in iTunes in the past was that you bought the music and then you bought a new a laptop or a phone or whatever, and you had to pay again to download, which I think most consumers thought was really stupid. I certainly thought it was stupid. I'd already paid uh, Amazon for the music. Why can't I just download it again? And that's kind of where we're getting to is you're buying these licenses. You're act I mean, it's actually a licensed transaction where you're buying a license to some content. And the bits don't matter the same way that the CD used to matter as a, a tangible physical copy. And, you know, so I get it. You know, that any transition comes with winners and losers. And in, in this case, the people who make extravagant physical objects like this label, they're going to be the losers. But in the long term, I think the consumer wins because they get to buy a license to some media that they want. They don't have to worry about storing it. They don't have to worry about backing it up. They don't have to worry about preserving a physical copy, which is uh, an extreme burden on the consumer, really. And they just have to worry about listening to music, which is all anybody wants to do. And so for labels to complain is, I feel like they're just saying, well, we're going to be left out. Like the things that labels do, promotion and marketing and all this stuff, we're going to be left out. And now it's up to the artist to say, well, listen to the song and pay me. And then now I can pay for additional marketing. I, is that, I mean, it's a balance. I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but it, it's definitely the transition. Yeah. And I would think in the case of independent artists, you know, they either have a very niche following or are clamoring to have more of a broad following and that you would want to, if you were in that situation, to be available to your audience in every possible way, including on iTunes Match. So it does seem to me like uh, it's something that, that is leaving the artist, but not necessarily their intermediary label out in the cold. Uh, Evan, any thoughts? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, it's like if you've stolen the music, if I've gone out, and you know, we're talking about Bon Jovi a little bit before, um, mm -hmm. if I'd gone out and stolen Slippery When Wet, and I'm still listening to it, right? Bon Jovi gets some inter incremental revenue from iTunes Match now. Maybe it's nothing, or you know, maybe it's close to nothing. Maybe it's a, a penny. But that's one penny that they didn't have before. And you know, laughing in the face of that penny is kind of like, well, then you're consumed. The people who stole the music are just going to keep look listening to it for free. You might as well take the penny, you know, and figure out a new way to make revenue. Right, or or old ways to make revenue. We were talking about Bon Jovi before we started recording today, and uh, Evan was talking about. Um, how they're able to pull in huge current audiences uh, to concerts. Is that right, Evan? That's Yeah, that was the point I was making, you know, mm -hmm. and just to, just, to, just to say it for the benefit of those who are actually watching live now or listening later, you know, the point I was making, and I was kind of being uh, humorous about it, was the how smart Bon Jovi and all those who are, you know, the label and everybody who's promoting it has been to extract money from two different generations. You know, my parents' generations, you know, bought the, the cassettes for their kids or, you know, gave them allowance money to the kids to buy uh, the cassette. Now that I'm a 30-something and I have friends who are 30-somethings and 40-somethings, they're paying big bucks to go, you know, be front and center uh, to watch him. Uh, you know, at, the, at the, you know, in, at, in concert. So, you know, there's something to be said about that, which which stands for the proposition that there's so much more. Uh, I mean, this is obvious of, of a revenue stream. Uh, there is a huge revenue stream that is outside just the sale of music, whether that be over uh, over the internet or from the cloud or you know stored in the cloud and the the, the what Neely is calling the incremental revenue from that uh, or, or or whatever. So you know it's it's much broader than sometimes our first perspective on all of this is. Um, as far as what this this indie label here is saying, this Numero Group is is saying. I mean, it, it's hard to really get a get an idea of what their true motives are here because it seems to be tinged 
a little bit with nostalgia, which is easy to understand in all of this stuff. You know, the, the quote that, that we were talking about just a second ago about how his, his preference would be that the backup be the LP or even better yet, the vinyl. That notion, that sentiment is, I think, apples, you know, is an orange to the uh, analysis of apples to apples comparison of what we'd be doing when we look at the pure economics of music and when we look to the benefit of the consumer and how they actually get music and the convenience and the cost and all that stuff. And because there's that external influence of this nostalgia, you know, the, the attachment uh, to the, the tangible aspect of music, it's really hard to, to, to see what is motivating this kind of discussion, uh, even if that's something other than uh, the incentive that Numero Group may have to speak up in this time of change, just to draw attention to this, uh, to this fact for the sake of Numero Group's own benefit. And it, it's something that's compelling if it's done in the name of the artist interest, because that's something that uh, will we'll make people's ears perk up and listen to and perhaps for the first time think, oh, wait, maybe uh, this whole notion of iTunes match and music in the cloud is not all that great because it will stifle uh, the uh, creativity of, of, the, of the artists. It, there's, there's a number of different ways that one could examine the motives of, of the different commentary on this issue. Well, here's, I think, here's a really interesting, another really interesting quote from uh, CVA is, we are primarily a physical goods company. Uh, we don't get too bogged down in bootlegging. But for Apple to say that your bootlegs are welcome, it just bothers us. Now, I think that's, you know, Apple's selling a digital product. You know, and they're, uh, you know I, I think iTunes Match is in many ways a, a half step. I think it's, it, it, they didn't go all the way. They didn't do, I, I can get into that later. But to say we're a physical goods company and now Apple's coming in and effectively um, you know, obsoleting our physical goods with digital technology, I, that's where they're lost. Right. I, I don't think you can continue to be a physical media company, right? Where you, you make some object of media and you sell it. You know, and if you look, you know, the Amazon example is a really good one. They're aggressively pursuing what they see as the digital future of books, right? And they're going to keep selling the physical books as long as people want them, but people are already buying more digital books. Um, and, you know, Apple upended the music industry by saying people don't want to buy CDs anymore. They're going to want to buy digital copies of music. And Everybody's trying to do the same with movies in the living room. So, you know, it, you feel bad, right? It's nostalgia. You feel bad for these companies that have done something for so long. But, you know, it, I think it, it's a kind of ridiculous counterexample, but it's like if the teleporter came out tomorrow and we were all sad because GM was like, well, we don't get to make cars anymore. Well, that's sad, right? I, you know, I still want a Corvette and maybe some little company should still make those. But the teleporter is going to be the future, you know, and you got to let it go. And I, I feel like that's what the, these physical media companies are going through right now. That's what they're experiencing. It, right. Yeah, I, think they, a, it, I think they almost ahead. have to look at it as a loss leader that there's, you know, a, a niche of people who will continue to want things like vinyl for uh, very niche reasons, you know, for audio quality and the experience and the feel of the actual object in your hand and, the grooves being played by the needle, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, that's going to be something that they're just going to have to suck it up and make available. It's probably going to be expensive to make those items. But, uh, you know, you can carry that on for nostalgia purposes. But, but, but you should take that revenue and pay the, the artist, right? You should take the cost of what it takes to make. I mean, I'm sitting in, in front of a rack of CDs. Like, I'm, you know, I'm mm -hmm. not... I find they're, you know, they, they mean something to me. I acquired them over time. But shouldn't these labels be taking all the money they're, take, they're spending on producing pieces of plastic and use that to go develop new artists and actually pay artists for money? I mean, isn't that more valuable to us than we made, you know, this thing that you can buy? I mean, it's like newspapers. You know, shouldn't, if I was running the New York Times, the first thing I'd do is shut down the printing plants because I know that news to me is more valuable online and to have some thing. And that thing, you know, has emotional resonance to me, but it probably won't have any emotional resonance for my kids. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, what, I don't know what if I would shut down. Sorry, Evan, I keep cutting you off. I, I don't shut know if me I would down. Shut, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> shutting down. I, I don't know if I would uh, shut down the paper. You know, I mean, I could see that there would be a reason and a customer base. You know, as long as you could make the economics of actually producing a limited run and distributing it work, then why not keep the physical product in some way, shape, sure. or form? But it shouldn't be the going forward soul of your business. Now, Evan. 
Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, we're making a distinction here between uh, aesthetics and utility, you know, because, you know, Neela, you were saying, you know, sh shut down the, the press, do all this stuff or stop making plastic, you know, for the benefit of the artist, because you can dump more revenue to toward the artist. And that's going to make, you know, the musical experience better. So, that, you know, what I was saying, it's an apples and orange comparison if we're going to try to translate one into the other, just because those have two different meanings to the to the consumer for different uh reasons or, or, or whatever. And so the, an irony I see in all of this is that, um, you know, whereas CDs and tangible media used to be the where the hits came out, I'm thinking of this in terms of a long tail analysis. The irony of this is, is that, you know, the tangible medium now may occupy a place out there in the long tail just for those who are enthusiastic about the, the tangible experience or something like that. It's no longer what dominates the marketplace, but it's something that's out there and still plays a role, um, not because it may be the, uh, the best and the easiest way to get to it or not because it ultimately benefits the bottom line of the artist, but because it's just something that the consumer likes uh, for its own sake. The exact, uh, it's the exact uh, analog, uh, perfectly analogous to what you were saying in the world of the teleporter, you know, you still may want to, um, you want to have a Corvette. I personally would, you know, want a Barracuda from 1973, <laughs> but, you know, there's, a, there's that, there's that, uh, that, that whole notion, that the desire that the consumer has there. Right. You know, I think that's why vinyl is actually still very popular and actually, I think, becoming increasingly more popular. Because if you're going to say, well, now it's the physical experience of music that's important, right? You have this big object that you're buying and you have to store. You might as well make it the biggest, most analog object that you can get, right, which is a vinyl record. And it's, you know, I, 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 I don't know if any of you have record players, but, you know, I have a record player. Uh, and I have a record collection and I actually love like getting a record out and like you've got this huge album art and you, you know, there's all this, you know, magic incantations of like reducing vibration around your record player and buying a needle and stylus. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's geeky in its own unique way. And that's all fun. Like, I love that stuff. But in terms of, you know, in, in a way that the CD isn't right. I think most people's primary CD player is their computer. Right. So it's not like as, is physical and tangible. And I think that's why, you know, I think vinyl sales will continue to increase and do well while the CD kind of drops out. And I, it, it all comes back to, you know, it's like classic cars. I think that's a really good comparison. People love classic cars. They, they're not practical. They're not useful, but they're great. Not, right. not good gas mileage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it depends which one. Um, we've got a couple of good comments from the chat room. Um, iPad 48787 is commenting that we really don't know how much the artists are supposed to get out of the iTunes match deal. I'm sure that that varies by label. Um, so the thought that occurs to me is, you know, this is just more evidence how record labels and artists uh, probably need or should be thinking about parting ways as far as the artists are concerned. I know, you know, it's hard to fly by yourself and get the kind of traction that you need to have a career, but you're certainly not getting a whole lot of help from the record labels. And then uh, Web1038 says uh, he or she is a professional musician, hears every day the same thing. Why is music today inferior to previous decades? It's simple. You get what you pay for, and today it pays nothing for the artist, I assume. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're in this strange world where the artist record label relationship is not really doing the job anymore. And uh, we need to find a model for artists that will. Uh, Evan, any thoughts on that? Um, that's a that's a tough one because there's this ideal of wanting to empower artists, but you know at the same time it's a big world. There are many consumers, there are many artists, and you know how can we be sure that the uh, that the the best music is getting to the people who want to hear it the most? And to me, you know, despite uh, the rise in the early and mid part of the last decade in the concept of folksonomy and stuff like that, it still seems like a, a, a a less efficient way of making sure that, pe and I know this is going to get people in the chat room talking, <laughs> it seems to be, a, a, there does not seem to be a suitable replacement for the model that we have now where it's a record label who's uh, responsible for promoting and getting music in front of people. So I'm going to duck now and let the tomatoes fly my way. <laughs> so it's not the record label that's important, right? The record label is a, the kind of like function of the market that used to exist, right? The, the question is, when you have infinite choice, how do you choose, 
right? And it, you don't. I mean, the, the, for most people, they don't choose. They go to a trusted source. They go to a portal or they go to an aggregator or something. And that source, whatever, the Spin Magazine or Pitchfork or Metacritic says, this is what's good. This is what you should choose. And for the longest time, the record label uh, industry, that whole part of the media industry said, okay, we're going to start driving choice. And the label said, we know this will sell. This will appeal to a large number of people. So we'll sign this band. We'll pay them a lot of money and send them around the country and people will buy the records. And that's like an important function, right? I mean, a, a regular, you know, I was in like a college band and then I was in a band when I was out of college and we got paid like $200 a gig. Like we couldn't, nobody can support themselves doing that. We, you know, what we wanted, the goal of being in, in that band was, oh, we'll, we'll get signed to a label. They'll pay us a lot of money to make a record and go tour. And then we won't worry about the economics of how they make that work for them. Now, that's insane. And, you know, that's, I was 19 and I didn't think, well, I, I should get paid directly from the consumer because there's a, a regime in place that is inefficient in my benefit. I was 19. I wanted to be a rock star, right? Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I think that's, that's what's happening here. It's, the, the portals are shifting. The aggregators are shifting. It's, you, people don't want to make all these choices. They want to sit down and listen to some music that makes them happy. They want to sit down and watch a TV show or a movie that makes them happy. And the, the, it's, the question is, who is going to just start deciding for people? Is it going to be the labels? Is it going to be a bunch of online critics at Pitchfork? Is it going to be something else? And we're just going through that transition. And we'll get through it. And you know, we'll figure out how to pay for things. But this transition, it's not short. It's not over. You know, the copyright wars haven't ended because we all have computers now and, you know, we all have had iPods and now we have iPhones or whatever. It's, it's still happening. We're still figuring out how to make this work for everybody in the right way because everybody's taste is constantly changing. And these old regimes of choice have dropped away. Well, over at time.com, Jerry Brido has an article on how the copyright wars haven't ended simply because we will soon have iTunes match. And he makes the point that your music any isn't any less illegal simply because you're legitimizing it in some way through iTunes Match. And we talked about this a bit last week that, you know, technically you could still, if you have some enormous Napster era music library uh, lurking on your computer, you could still get sued for that by the RIAA or, um, you know, another interested party and uh, find yourself in the terrible boat of having paid for this service and also have faced the, you know, terrible statutory damages liability that are, uh, that is available under the Copyright Act. Um, I think it would be a really interesting and high profile lawsuit were that to happen, but it is possible. Um, Neil, I do you think that that's just sort of pie in the sky and they would never do this or um, that they're preserving their rights? Well, I, I think there's, for there's four or five different places on the spectrum, right, of that mm -hmm. analysis. There's I stole all this music when I was in college, and now I'm paying for iTunes Match, and I don't take any further actions. You know, I just pay for what I pay for, and I listen to it. I think you're fine. I think that's the whole point is to to get the penny or whatever it is from the people who had previously stolen. And I think at the other end of the scale is you're paying for iTunes Match, uh, but you're still downloading and sharing thousands upon thousands of files. And I think that person's still going to get sued. And I, I can't imagine that any court would say, well, they're in the clear. They're paying for iTunes match. Right. Because it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Now, there's a whole spectrum of gray area in between those two scenarios. And I, I, I still think, you know, I don't think the iTunes match license agreement says, you're off the hook, buddy. Um, and I, I can't see the court, you know, s sliding that into the traditional copyright infringement analysis and saying, well, contractually, you've, you know, the labels have waived their liability. I, I don't know where that comes from. So, I mean, from, yeah, a, it's a, it's, from a business standpoint, though, if they start suing a lot of users who are also iTunes match subscribers, you're in some sense killing the goose that laid the golden egg. I guess maybe the point is, is that the egg is not so golden, that uh, the money they're making from this is money they wouldn't otherwise have, but money that's so this, not. This, uh, I think, I think that this iTunes match to me is super half-assed. I'm just going to say, it, okay, here's a problem with iTunes Match. It's great. It's a great way to take, you know, my guilt from I was 17 in college or whatever, and I stole a bunch of songs, and now, I'm, you know, I have a job, and I can pay for them, and I feel bad about it, but I don't want to go out and buy them all again, so I'm going to pay the service. That's great. That's a good goal. What they should have done is just launched a full-on subscription service. 
to go after the market of people who want unlimited access to new music. And if they'd done that, then I think it's a little different. I think that whole dynamic changes. It's, okay, fine. You know, I pay for a service called RDM. It's $9 a month. I, we talk about it on the This Is My Next podcast all the time. That's, what, that's the future. That's the real future. That's, I'm paying an ongoing license fee to stream music, to download it to my mobile device so you can listen to it offline. And, you know, it's... It's there. I don't, it's, it, that is the cloud, right? It's, here's the money. I want to listen to music. With Apple, it's, here's, here's the money. Make me feel better in my heart about what I did before. And that's, like, I don't care about that. I, that's, that's, that's the old way. I don't, I don't need absolution for my sins, right? I need a new product that's good. And mm-hmm. I need to move forward into the future. And that's, Apple, I think they missed it. I think they missed an enormous opportunity to awaken the sleeping giant of consumer demand for subscription services. And they've gotten halfway there. I certainly hope that they'll go all the way there. Right. And, and I have a couple of other just sort of lingering thoughts about this. Of course, they have not uh, announced any plans to include video in iTunes Match, but that's something that could happen down the, the line. But the, the dynamic there is somewhat different because, you know, the people have always excoriated the uh, movie industry for locking down DVDs so tightly. And, of course, BitTorrent aside, um, CSS has been fairly effective, you know, for the, the person who's not going to go out and actively seek out a torrent site. Um, they're not going to go out and download some sort of ripping uh, add-on to rip their DVDs. They're playing their DVD in their computer or their DVD player, and they're ordering it from Netflix, and they're, you know, living this legal and record, in, or I'm sorry, movie industry paying <laughs> lifestyle um, that, that the record industry never had. So, I mean, it seems like CSS actually worked for the movie industry, and they can now sort of call the shots as to how they're going to uh, confront the digital arena. They haven't really done it all that well yet. Um, so, you know, Evan, or, or should we be applauding them? I mean, they've certainly taken enough flack for it over the years. Well, I just wonder if it has more uh, to do with the nature of how we consume video content versus how we consume music content and also the nature of a particular digital file containing video content versus the nature of a digital file containing music content. With music, we want to have access to a bunch of different works in a relatively short period of time. You know, in the course of an hour, you might want to have access to, you know, 12 different uh, pieces of music, whereas in an hour's time, you may only be able to consume half of one, you know, full-length film. Um, as far as you know, short digital content goes, that's all. You know, I mean, just you can see the the variety and the texture of things that are on YouTube, and you see there's very little uniformity uh, in that across the, the the spectrum because a lot of that is just user-generated content and all that stuff. So I guess the point I'm trying to drive at here is a service like iTunes Match doesn't seem like it would lend itself as well to um, doing what it does to video like it does with music because this whole concept of syncing it up may not uh you know technologically work all that well and as far as you know the fact that we consume you know one half of a visual uh, audio visual work in the course of an hour may make us as consumers more willing or um you know less less subject or less less uh make make piracy of that stuff less desirable uh in a in a way that's different or make the desirability of that piracy different in kind than what it is for uh, audio works alone, music works, because of the, the, the way that it's consumed. You can tell that I'm just kind of thinking aloud and, and kind of fleshing these concepts out. So maybe 15 minutes later, I'll see that it was just kind of <laughs> kind of silly. But, you know, it, it, I, the fundamental idea that's, that's presenting itself to me here is that they're, just the way that we consume video is different than the way that we consume music. And that has to have something to do with the distribution models and the modes that we want to get in when we're either one thinking about pirating it or two thinking about consuming it and using it using it later that has to play into it somehow that that is not being addressed by some of the some of the other basic assumptions that we're making on all this this topic yeah your points there might explain i should i should interject that css stands for content scrambling system thank you irc for pointing out that i was just tossing that term out without explaining what it was and it is the technology that 
encrypts DVDs so that you cannot just pop one into your computer and rip the content off without some kind of add-on software uh, that enables you to do that and software companies that can have I, made that. Can I be that. super pedantic about this, actually? Sure, I don't, yes. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's a lawyer show. I, I don't feel too bad about it. Right, it's right, not right. CSS no. that was effective, right? CSS is, is uh, super ineffective, and it's, you can break it with a haiku or something, right? Uh, you well, don't, yeah, it's but not effective. Do, do <laughs> so real people effective, really do you know, that? I mean, I know, I know that there are, you know, are thousands of geeky people who do that. Maybe millions. But, but, but just hear, hear me out for one second. Okay. It's DMCA that was effective. And it's the mere presence of CSS on the DVD coupled with the DMCA that wrecked the economy for commercial mass market DVD ripping solutions, right? Because they're illegal. You can't build a business selling a DVD ripping program. Um, right. And that means that whole sector of the market doesn't exist. Right. There's all these solutions to do it. And, I, you know, if you do go on BitTorrent, which is, I think, actually where most people get their music as well now. Right. I think if you go on Torrents and you, you look for a movie, you can find any movie that you want. And, the, you know, mm -hmm. the quality is on even all this other stuff. It, CSS itself wasn't effective. It's the regime that was imposed by the DMCA. And yes. just the simple fact that CSS is on there, that means that whole side of the market doesn't exist. Now, at Evan's point, I agree with him. You know, movies are huge. They're, you know, HD movies are gigabytes in size. You really only watch them on your TV. Um, and if you want to watch them on a smaller device, you have to re-encode them, which takes a whole bunch of time, all this other stuff. There's all these reasons why, um, you know, music and movies are different. I, I think everybody recognizes those reasons. And they're, they're really, I mean, they're really different the way we consume them. Right. But I, Do you guys remember when the music industry started to try and sell those encrypted music CDs? Right, because but you want to listen to music everywhere. That's the thing. You don't want to really watch movies everywhere, right? You yeah. want to watch movies on your TV or maybe on a plane or whatever. Uh, with music, you want it everywhere. You want it on your in your living room. You want it in your car. You want it on every piece of portable gear you have. You want it on all of your computers. You want to share it. There's all these things that you want to do with music that the DRM stands in the way of. With movies, it's you want to watch it. And so that's what, you know, Netflix in many ways is the iTunes match of the music in the, of the movie industry. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, maybe you ripped Ferris Bueller's Day off. Well, now it's on Netflix. So, you know, you've, you've, you've paid your penance and you've moved on and you're paying your $7 a month Netflix. And uh, that's, I mean, to me, that's more meaningful. I don't think anybody ever complains about Netflix DRM. I don't, they, you know, it's DRM to hell and back, right? But nobody right. complains about it because it works everywhere. They've solved that core problem of, of distribution, which it, Netflix works on your computer, it works on your iPad, it works on your TV, it works on your Android phone, if you have a special Android phone. Um, and that's really the key to DRM. You know, Michael Gartenberg, who used to write a column for me in Engadget, always used to say, DRM is fine. Just don't use it to protect your old business model. If you use it to create a new business model, everyone will love you for it. And I, I think that's true. Yeah, good lesson. Uh, the folks at the um, Electronic Frontier Foundation and others have been lobbying the music industry for years to adopt a compulsory license sort of regime in, in order to combat or, or face the economic realities of illegal downloading. Do you think that uh, iTunes Match sort of is a substitute, a contractually, privately agreed substitute for that kind of a regime? What do you think, Evan? Whether iTunes Match is a uh, replacement for 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 what compulsory sure. licensing? So you know a tax yeah. that would be imposed on everyone that takes into account that music is illegally downloaded and you know skims some money off and sends it over mm -hmm. to the suffering and put upon record industry because you know things like healthcare and education and alternative fuels and global warming, you know, are, are not as important as making sure they get paid. Wow. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I mean, I like, I, to be honest, I had never even thought about it in, in, in those terms. And, and clearly we can make some, uh, make some arguments to make it sound like a compulsory license. But, but what I think would happen if we were to go through that analysis, we would see that it may end up in the same result with the same result as what a compulsory license would, but there are plenty of uh, kind of practical distinctions that we could make to, to show where it's not really representing those interests in the same way. Um, it, you know, the, the nice thing about it is that it does seem to actually get 
uh, both interests, you know, the, the, the public interest, the interest of the consumer dealt with and the interest of the, uh, the, the content industry dealt with. The question that remains is how effectively is that dealing with being done and, and whose interest is actually being taken care of better than the other. And, um, you know, it, it seems like there's a market force that's taking care of this uh, that is actually doing it and dealing with that uh, in lieu of uh, something coming from the top down, which, you know, which is, as you were talking about, you know, the government would be the one to have to do that compulsory license. And, you know, there are some issues that we do as, uh, with that, which as a society, our legislature, you know, should be dealing with um, the least of those not being that you shouldn't um, send dirty pictures of yourself with using <laughs> Twitter, and, Twitter and y -frog. There should be a compulsory <clears throat> yeah. tax for, uh, for dong pictures on Twitter. You just, have, yes. you, just, you just have to, you owe the government like $50,000 because you screwed up. I think you guys just <laughs> solved global warming. There we go. <laughs> Carbon offsets That's how we for GM the fails. Money. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I always talk, I, I always sound like a crazy socialist when I talk to you. I, I don't know why. You, you, make, you make me feel bad about my faith in the government. Because um, I, I, you know, I have too much faith in the government. But, you know, when there's like radical incentive misalignment between consumers and industry, there is a little wiggle room for the government to say, okay, you know, we actually are the government of the people. You know, this is just not our government. It's not some, you know, religious force out there. It's like our government. And so if there is like radical incentive misalignment, I, and I don't think there is in the music industry, but in other industries there are. When there is that misalignment, it, I think it's appropriate for the government to say, well, we, you know, this market is not serving the best interests of the consumer. It's not serving the best interests of policy or society. And here's a tiny little bit of regulation. Now, I don't think compulsory licensing in the music industry or people who download music uh, is evidence of, of <laughs> it's like a solution. I don't, I don't think there is enough misalignment there, but in other cases there are. You know, I think like, this is gonna sound insane, but I think like DRM interoperability is actually like, the industry will never get there on their own and consumers mm -hmm. will always suffer because you know, everybody wants to lock in an ecosystem. And I, you know, I think there's a case to say, well, maybe, maybe the FCC and the FTC should say, if you're gonna build a DRM system, it has to be you know, at some level interoperable so that when consumers buy something, it can run content from a number of devices. And you know, I don't think the market's really young and I don't think we've seen enough harm to, to justify that yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if 10 years down the road, we got to that point because I don't, I don't want 10 different lock ecosystems in my living room. I just want to watch content and be happy and pay for it. Yeah. Right. Well, on that note, I'm leaving. Apparently, it's a conflict, total chat killer. Well, it, no, it, uh, <laughs> I don't think you should feel like a, uh, a socialist. And to the extent you do, you know, don't feel bad about that. I just wrote down <laughs> a, a term that you said. And, well, you know, the observation I make about you, Neil, is that, wow, you really are a University of Chicago guy. If you're going to... <laughs> In, using a conversation like this, the, the notion of radical incentive misalignment. I mean, that's just... There we I'm go. Sorry. I apologize uh, for, my, for everything I've oh, done. We just got to listen closely to what you're saying. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah. Nila, you talked about uh, RDO and being able to get uh, your, your content wherever you want, however you want it. Um, and that I, I do agree with you that uh, the DRM situation isn't going to sort itself out. So there have to be um, other solutions. And uh, one such solution is Pandora that went public this week. Uh, let's talk about that. Why do you love uh, RDO more than Pandora? Um, Pandora is a radio server. You know, they're different. It's funny because one is actually called RDO and they mm -hmm. instruct you to not call it radio. Um, mm -hmm. And I wish it actually had a lot of Pandora esque features. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Pandora is radio, and I think RDO is actually a cloud music service. So, you know, they're different. It's, you still can't just type in the name of the song to Pandora and, ne and necessarily get exactly what you want the way you want it. You kind of right. get this list, you know. So it's different. But, you know, I, what was it? Once upon a time, we, we went to AT&T, and we looked at their Genox Center and the Engadget Show, their Global Network Operations Center. They had this big chart of network traffic on the wall, and, you know, you know it was constantly spiking. They said, this grows every day. But if you look at the big chunk, it's uh, Netflix, Pandora, and porn. And that's mostly what we move on our network, which is hilarious to think about. Um, and so, that, you know, it's, this isn't Groupon. You know, it's like Pandora sells a service that people love, and they love it deeply. Um, whether they can continue to effectively monetize that service, 
I mean, this is the same question. It's who do you pay and what do you get for music and media? Um, but, you know, they're close. Like, you know, they have an actual product that people love and they identify with. And, you know, my, my fiance wears a Pandora T-shirt, you know, all, all the time because she loves Pandora. Um, I, I think that's important. You know, it's, it's more important than, you know, we, we send you coupons in the mail or whatever it is, which is stupid. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm more angry about Groupon than Pandora. Pandora's great. Yeah, I think they're a great company. I want them to succeed. And I, I think this is evidence of the fact that they've built a foundation of success. And, you know, however the media landscape shakes out, I think that they're going to be a part of it because people, people love their actual product, which you, you don't actually see that a lot, uh, especially, you know, I, I review products all day long. You don't see people who love a product and identify with the brand the way Pandora does. And I don't know if they're the future. I think they might be the future of like radio because they do this on-demand radio. But the 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 other stuff that like the RDOs and the MOGs and the Zoom actually does, where you have access to this ongoing license to music, they don't do that yet. If they go into that, I think they'll blow up the universe. Don't you think that it probably just might boil down to a geek factor when it comes to this? I mean, Pandora is so easy, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, it may have more to do just with the ease of use of the user interface, you know, versus kind of the more tinkering that you have to do to make the RDO experience meet. And I'm not suggesting that it's difficult to use RDO, although I, I have not used it. I must, must, you know, say that. But I mean, what could be more simple than Pandora, which gives them, a, you know, a great way to be very mainstream and to that extent that they can become mainstream and, and be actually easy to use. It's like shooting fish in a barrel for them to market it and to, to be, you know, accepted and to have a potential market cap of two billion, which just right. absolutely blows me away. I can't. Well, you know, I can't goes, believe that. This goes uh, right back to to how do you choose, right? I mean, that's what this is. It's you tell Pandora one thing that you like, and it makes a series of decisions about what else you might like. And that's, I think, in new things and old things and things you maybe never heard about. And some old, you know, it makes all of these choices for you. And it's not just the ease of the user interface. It's that sort of ease of experience where. You're like, ah, oh, I don't have to decide. I don't have to make a playlist. I don't have to figure out what to listen to next. And, you know, they're two very different experiences. But, like, if you're at work and you just want to listen to music that you will not be irritated by, like, Pandora solves that need in the most direct and, like, amazing way that, that I think any sort of music service has ever in the history of music done. You know, the radio doesn't do it. That, they, the radio is annoying, you know. Pandora is not. It's like maybe you'll hear a song you don't like and you push a button and then you get 50 songs you do like. And I think that's really key. You know, I think that they're solving that what does radio feel like in the future problem. And while RDO, which now in this context is a super ironic name, is solving that what does iTunes look like in the future. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's significant that that market cap of Pandora's is grounded entirely on the licensing agreements that it has struck with the music industry and that those licensing agreements do not function like conventional radio. You know, they're not paying per, well, they may be paying per play, but it's, it's not, mm -hmm. you know, like a radio station's license. Uh, as far as I know, you know, I think that they've, they've negotiated something completely separate and unique. Um, for yeah. their kind of business model. And it's also significant that those licensing constraints that they have to abide by to get the music industry to buy into this are not that onerous for users. You can only skip a certain number of tracks per hour, but you know, you can skip a few, a good few tracks. And uh, the other thing that is bothersome is uh, the constraint on how many play, uh, playlists. Uh, that's a, you can't really call them playlists. So you, they call them stations. Uh, you can create, they're capped at 100. And um, that gets, you know, annoying too, because then you have to kick one out to make room for a new one. Uh, but still, even all that aside, it's, it's I think, a, a pretty powerful thing that they've done, um, the deal that they've struck with the industry. So... You know, I'm bullish on it anyway. Um, I do want to uh, get to talking about another DMCA and copy protection issue, this time a novel one that no court has ever decided uh, that just came out this week. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to thank a company we've been talking about a lot in this discussion, Netflix, which is a sponsor of this show. 
Uh, we're brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad. The iPad app is amazing. Um, it works great and really makes the experience fantastic when you can uh, take those movies with you anywhere you are. Uh, you can watch on your iPhone as well, which has that same mobility feature and, as Neil I was saying, some Android phones too. If you have a gaming console, an Xbox 360, a PS3, or a Wii, you can watch Netflix right there through those consoles on your TV. And if you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with Apple TV or Roku or lots and lots of DVD players have the software built right into them. They're very inexpensive and easy to use. So with Netflix, you can watch movies and TVs in, TV shows instantly using any of these devices, and you can begin watching a movie or show, show on one device and then finish it on a different one. So they've got that time and place shifting thing down. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want, anytime you want, and you can cancel anytime. So try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial. And we thank Netflix for their support of TWIT and This Week in Law. And we hope you'll enjoy watching with Netflix too. So let's talk about these nude shock jock DJs uh, who um, had a photo taken of them by a magazine. They, uh, their radio station decided to use that photo. They liked it so much. That uh, they took out the attribution in the photo and then put it up on their website and encouraged users to mix it up, play with it, reuse it, etc. But they were neither the photographer nor in the licensee nor in any way the rights holder of the, the photo. And they took out, you know, a watermark kind of thing on the photo that said who it did belong to. Um, so there was a DMCA-oriented lawsuit brought that got tossed out at the trial court level on summary judgment. Uh, the magazine lost. But now the Third Circuit has gotten that case and issued a decision and decided, uh, as no other court has before, that these photo credits, watermarks or another sort of uh, indication on a photograph <coughs> of the attribution of that photograph, is going to be a copy protection device that is covered under the DMCA. Uh, Neil, do you think that this will have broad ramifications? Uh, that's insane. Um, I mean, <laughs> my understanding of the DMCA is that it has to be like an effective lock, right? Isn't this language? Uh, it has to be an effective copy protection device that can actually prevent people from making copies. Uh, and I don't know how the Third Circuit got to there. This feels to me like it should just be a straight-up infringement case. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that, I'd have to read the decision. I mean, I'm just reading this Hollywood Reporter article. Um, but that seems to me like it's completely wrong. I mean, it, the, the basic level, I mean, this, the, you were talking about CSS. I mean, CSS is ineffective, right? I mean, you can hack it in any number of really trivial ways. But the court found that because it's there, and it actually protects people from making copies, or protects the rights holder from other people making copies, that it's effective within the bounds of the law. But that, that's the core of it, is that it does something. It, it, a watermark doesn't do anything. It just makes you feel bad because you know, you're a jerk. And I, I don't think that's like an effective technological measure that prevents <laughs> people from making copies. Well, it actually is a different part of the DMCA than, you know, the parts that deal with the anti-circumvention, you know, that gives rise to this right. cause of action, this messing with copyright management information. So, you know, as CMI. much as it's... CMI. That's uh, right. That, doesn't that sound sorry, like... I haven't should, read the... I, I apologize if I, I sound stupid. I haven't read this. I'm just riffing here. Yeah, okay. well, I don't think anybody's going to think you sound stupid, Neil. But um, the, the, the idea of it is, is just what you talked about, Neil, I think is... This whole notion of, yeah, it should make you feel like a jerk to do that. I, I don't know if that's anywhere in the legislative history that, the, that <laughs> they thought, oh, this is going to be a call to conscience for, for people when they're cropping <laughs> out stuff on, on photos. But, but I mean, I, I don't see any other basis for, you know, this, this provision, which, you know, is a separate form of liability from 
anti from the circumvention of these technological measures that are used to protect access or copying of a work, and it's separate and apart from infringement. And I, um, you know, I I I don't see why that those things should be you know thought of as. Uh, the same thing, and indeed, they're all very much mutually exclusive. So that that really is where it where it, it's supposed to operate on people psychologically to to not do this. But it also has an economic benefit as well in the you know the to to the extent there actually is a real value to the attribution. There is the potential for loss, and and it's probably the closest place anywhere in the Copyright Act that the at least in the U.S. and it's the closest place in the U.S. Copyright Act where. We deal with something like the, the idea of moral rights, a concept that's clearly recognized in in Europe, and it's also kind of recognized in Section 106A of the Copyright Act. I don't want to get too arcane and all this stuff, but there's something that seems to be baked into this idea of there is something that should be legally actionable for taking away attribution, and, and this is the the closest way, or the most, um, or the the least nebulous way that that's that's articulated in the copyright laws that we have here in the U.S. Can I, can I get super practical? Um, I mean, I, you know, I, at Engadget, we generated thousands upon thousands of watermark and copyrighted images, right, that we took. Uh, mm -hmm. We do it at This Is My Next. We, every, every picture on the site, I think, we, we take. Um, you know, we train our, our editors when they come on to take good pictures and to make good videos. Um, and we, I have sent more emails to other publications, usually run by people who just simply don't know better, saying, well, you look, you took our photo, you cropped our watermark. That's, you know, you weren't, you didn't have a license to take the photo. I'm not going to sue you for copyright infringement. That's stupid. But, you know, here are the rules. You know, you can, you have to run the full photo with our full watermark. You have to link back to us and you can't take our whole gallery of photos. And, you know, that's like, that's our policy. It's not encapsulated in any law, but that's like the practical reality of watermarks in the internet. You put them on there so people know this photo came from somewhere and that's all, you know, you ever really want. Now, I don't know how you read that into the DMCA, um, and I, you know, I, I, I have to read 1201, and I have to read this decision more closely before I start riffing off and into the ether of my mind. But I'm saying, at a practical level, as somebody who has generated thousands of watermarked images, if somebody did this to one of my pictures, I would freak out. You know, I would be like, "Look, you're, you have to attribute me. You can't, you can't just take my thing because it was on the internet because it was available to you." You have to say it's from this guy, and the fact that they went on the radio and you know they questioned the sexual orientation. I mean, I would I would bring down every hammer I could, and if one of the hammers is twelve oh one copyright management information, well, hey, I mean, welcome to the courts. You know, like it, th these yeah. are all the tools I have at my disposal, right? You went off and did something bad, and here are all the consequences I can bring to bear on you. Whether that's right or wrong, I mean, that's that's like a. a you know, that's that, that's us on this show talking about the grand, you know, the, the grand spectrum of law and policy. But I, I, you know, I have a certain amount of empathy for for somebody who put a watermark in a picture and had that picture stolen. That's happened to me a lot, and I know what right. it feels like, and it sucks. And I, I know you've said that, you know, you you will go back and read all this stuff. But just for your information, it's it's section twelve oh two of the DMCA that all this is coming under, and it's you know, and, and I think that we do ourselves. Uh, the uh, reporter article says twelve oh one. Maybe that's, maybe I'm, that's where I'm getting confused. Maybe this. There, confused, so. there may have been something to do with it as well. But this whole the the, the provision dealing with the integrity of copyright management information comes in twelve oh two, and wow. you know it's conceptually very different than any kind of circumvention, like you know, going back to the discussion about CSS. You know, the cracking of the encryption. You know, for CSS would be a twelve oh one violation, yeah. and twelve oh two is something that's that's very different. It's a, it's completely different form of liability from the anti -circ from the circumvention, yeah. which is in turn a different form of liability than infringement. So, so can just I, for, I, I just brought up 1202. So this, this article that was linked, uh, it says 1201, which it was where I got super confused. So 1202B is super clear. I mean, uh, I'll just read it. No person shall, without the authority of the copyright owner of the law, uh, sub one, intentionally remove or alter any copyright, copyright management information. Now, so the entire question here is whether a watermark is copyright management information or an attribution line or a credit line. I mean, that's the whole question the court is answering. Is that? Yes. Yeah. And it, uh, I pasted the link to the decision in the IRC, but it probably oh, yeah. scrolled Sorry, by I'm, a while ago. I'm on a different computer. I don't have IRC. I, have, I apologize. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, so if, if the whole question is how do we define copyright management information? Evan, I'm just catching up to you, man. I'm sorry. Um, of course it is. I mean, it's a, it's a line that says copyright, you know, whatever. I mean, that's, how is that not management information? Am I, do I sound crazy? 
Is there a way that you could argue that it isn't? I mean, I, I don't know what the other side argued here. Yeah. What else, well, what else would it be? What 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 is the possibility? Like it's going to depend on what the watermark like, says, of course. I mean, if it's a watermark that just says where it's from, that's that's not necessarily you know going to pertain a priori to, to, to copyright. So um, I don't know if Section 1202 actually says something about it and gives it more of a, yeah, I mean, it's actually defined in 1202C there. Yes, yeah, right. So there I mean, are certain indicia of copyrightness that, that have to- The name of and other identifying information about the author work, that's, that's C2. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to think about what it could be. I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to know what anybody thinks this should be. I mean, is it, do I, do I have to send you like a, like a plaque that says this is my photo? <laughs> What what else could it be? There's the nostalgia of the tangible thing. Sure, yeah, that would be exactly. great. Like, thank you. Here's thank a, you. Here's a I don't know. Like here's a shield that says, you know, I took this photo. Like what what could it be? This this seems really stupid to me. Okay, I've completely yeah. They tried this, they tried you know. to split hairs over whether it was an automated copyright management system or not, um, and. Uh, by the way, that, in the course that of this conversation, the I'd like to point out that I've completely flip-flopped on the Third Circuit here. <laughs> I, I started out thinking they were totally wrong, and now I'm reading 1202, which I, I hadn't read in a long time. And uh, Yeah, these guys are stupid. The end. Yeah. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm leaving. <laughs> Exactly. No, it's a, it's an interesting decision because nobody's held this before that the DMCA would protect this kind of activity. And uh, now we have it from a federal circuit court that it does. Uh, so, and it also, there's also a fair use component to the decision that's pretty interesting where the um, radio station tried to argue that it was fair use to just take the unaltered copy and put it up on its website. Um, I could see where they would have some better arguments about the, you know, remixes that they're Listeners okay. might have made with them after and made with it after the fact, but the unaltered copy, you know, seems pretty clear that's, well, that. But that's like the that's that's a straight different. infringement. Like I, now I get it. Now now I understand why this photographer is bringing both causes of action, right? Because on the straight infringement level, you know, the radio station taking his photo and saying, "Look at how stupid our guys look," blah blah blah. Like you can make, a, a, I don't know, a, a, a halfway decent fair use argument there, right? You, there's commentary about the image for the image's sake, all this other stuff, and then you've got all these parodies. That all makes sense to me, you know? And, and that's, I can see how the straight infringement is like a 50-50 proposition, but mm -hmm. if you could bring this 1202, because that, that feels very strong because they did this other thing, then hey, you know, why not? Right. All right, well, uh, we've been talking about copyright. Let's shift gears for a bit and move on to Foursquare and data and other top apps that are uh, leaking. Seems like everything's leaking these days. Um, and there was a Wall Street Journal piece pointing out that uh, the Android applications of LinkedIn, Netflix, and Foursquare uh, have stored usernames and passwords in an unencrypted form on their Google-powered devices. Is anyone surprised by this? And uh, all I know is that I really liked the Engadget headline, which called this fail square. Evan? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is good. Um, yeah. Well, it, it was alarming for me for until June 7th um, because they, you know, I, I use an Android device and Foursquare pushed out an update which purportedly fixed this. You know, before that, you know, I'd be surprised, I was surprised to, to know about this because of the, um, I'm not a security expert. I, I don't know what, I, you know, I can't quote you chapter and verse of what the, the best practices are for, you know, implementation of, of security technology and all this stuff. But I am informed by what we've read about this that it is not best practices to allow the username and password to be in plain text. Seems very intuitive, you know, for me. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that I need any specialized training to think that that uh, doesn't uh, pass muster for, you know, what the a reasonable person would think. So um, as far as I'm concerned, at least her four square goes, it, the problem has been fixed. And, you know, I'm always glad to see, well, actually, there's kind of a, a mixed feeling about, uh, you know, when things like this come to light, you know, there's a very extreme position that people can take when they discover vulnerabilities. And what was done here by this firm in Chicago, I should give them a shout out. I don't know them, but, you know, anytime you can shout out to somebody in Chicago, that's all good. You know, this firm <laughs> that did this, uh, found about this exploit, I mean, they just, you know, kind of talked about it and made it very, you know, did a public proclamation. They didn't do like what the fire sheep guys did and actually distributed technology, which is going to allow people to easily um, leverage the uh, exploit and, you know, to be very nefarious about it. So 
Um, what was my point? Via forensics, they're called. V, okay, great. Yeah. Um, I, I kind of forget what my precise point is. It's just, oh, I guess it is that it's good to see that these things are made public so that action can be taken. Foursquare did the right thing by responding immediately with uh, with the security fix on this. And, uh, you know, it's 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 obviously inherently good that these kinds of things come to the public attention and that and it's even better when they're fixed before there's a chance for there to be uh, actually bad things done once the knowledge of the vulnerability is made public. It's also right. good that these guys didn't just hack Foursquare and like, yeah. steal all this stuff. I mean, because yeah. that's that appears to be the other way in which in which we react to security to security problems now is to you know to shut down PSN because we're mad you know because mm -hmm. right. what else would we do? We can't control <laughs> ourselves. We're all too bored yeah. trying to get to our music in the right way. Hey, well, uh, since we were talking about uh, having the right to sue over your misused content and someone who's build, built a whole business around that, we uh, really can't do the show without talking about what happened to Right Haven this week and uh, what they've been ordered uh, as far as uh, probably getting sanctioned uh, severely by a Las Vegas district court judge. Um, who has taken a close look, unlike the judges in many of the other cases that Wright Haven has brought, at uh, how Wright Haven actually has standing to sue. In other words, everyone knows they are not the copyright holder, but uh, the judge has gotten into the law and the arrangements between Wright Haven and I believe it's Stevens Media, their assignor, and figured out that, you know, indeed, in order to be able to sue for copyright infringement, you are supposed to be the rights holder. You are not supposed to simply be assigned a right to sue. Um, so uh, Rights Haven's ability, Wright Haven's ability to be able to, to continue all the actions that it has brought are seriously uh, now called into question. Uh, Evan, any thoughts on this? Yeah, this just really gives uh, life or it gives articulation to that which we have kicked around for a year which is so unsavory about Wright Haven and, and what it does. I mean, to be honest, I know that I've, I've been critical of Wright Haven uh, overtly on the, the show before, but in my heart of hearts, just like I do with, you know, so many uh, troubling issues, I've always tried to justify somehow or play the devil's advocate and somehow see some good in what they're trying to do. And, you know, it, it, it's perfectly reasonable and uh, one can do this in the abstract saying, well, Right Haven is doing something good for uh, whatever, the public interest or what have you by engaging in a system, setting up a system and engaging in it so that rights holders can enforce their rights in a way that, because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do it on an individual basis. And that is by assigning the copyright rights to one entity who then goes out and, and does this stuff. We actually talked about this, I talked about this with Eric Goldman and uh, Venkat and Jonathan Bailey on the week that you were you were out, mm -hmm. Denise, uh, a couple of weeks ago and you know, trying to say that Right Haven's actually doing something good here. But in situations like this, it becomes writ large just how kind of awful and how rotten and how uh, misguided Wright Haven truly is on this. And it, and it the, the judge says it's disingenuous at, at best and may even rise to the level of having been deceitful because essentially what we have found out is that Stevens Media, and I trust this is probably the same way with other publishers who are involved with, with Wright Haven who have you know, hired Wright Haven, I guess is a good way of putting it. They, they I mean, the, the, it's an illusion really, you know, there's this assignment of copyright to Wright Haven, but really it isn't an assignment at all because they, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away to bring the King James version into it here. Um, they've, they've assigned this copyright, but really it, it is actually nothing more than just a grant of rights to Wright Haven to do nothing other than file suit. And even that is limited, we learn, because Stevens Media, even though it purportedly has assigned these copyrights, still retains the right to say which cases Wright Haven can actually sue over. So it becomes completely smoke and mirrors, completely illusory, and thereby, you know, a loser kind of uh, argument as well for, for them to make here. So at the end of the day, what this does is just really underscore the thing that we found, uh, and it isolates and underscores the thing that we found so uh, despicable or so, you know, th that, that we didn't like about what Wright Haven is doing. And yeah, I hope they get sanctioned uh, big time. In this. I, I guess, why isn't Wright Haven a law firm? 
You know, this seems like they should have just set up a contingency fee arrangement, said we'll split 50% of the revenue or from the settlement and just been done. With. I, I, I don't understand why they, is there some reason they jumped through all these hoops to like assign copyright? Like, why didn't they just retain them as a firm? Why did, I, don't, I don't understand what the, the deal is there. Well, I mean, I, I suppose that's to somewhat shield the actual rights holders from public scrutiny on this. I mean, it's been no secret. I mean, and it, it, you know, it's not anything that can be concealed that it's the, the, the Las Vegas newspaper and, you know, the Denver Post and others, right, right. you know, that they're the actual rights holders in the original sense here. But I, I trust that it's something to, to keep them out of the actual caption of the case. You know, Stevens Media, not in there. It's only after, you know, this discovery has gone through and it, and it almost sounds like some of this information came across serendipitously that Stevens Media is actually disclosed as a true uh, party that has an interest, some skin in the game in all of this. So I, 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 the best guess that I have is just to kind of shield them from all that. I, there may be something more savvy. Yeah. I don't know. This yeah, I mean, like, Right Haven certainly has taken a lot of public flack for these lawsuits. So to the extent you can have someone do that on your behalf, I can see where that would be desirable. But you're right, Eli. It's it's a he the gentleman, uh, and I use that term loosely, who <laughs> has been pursuing these claims is a lawyer and and is his own law firm, I believe. So um, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense other than what. Uh, Evan or, why didn't, or why didn't they just assign the entire right and then re you know, license the content back to the, I mean, like, it, it, this is just bad lawyering. I mean, like, yeah. should have figured this out from the get go. Like, just assign the whole thing and, and assign it back down, like, or license it back down. Come on. Right. I don't think they thought get, it through. Get your stuff together. Let me just say that. The end. I'm getting more right, and more well, worked up now because I, I keep reading, <laughs> I keep reading 1202 and getting mad about what, the the plain meaning of the statute. Okay, I'm done. Damn, <laughs> I can just go. I, I don't mean to rage in your face. That's quite all right. <laughs> hey, before we call it the end, we have a tip and a resource of the week for you. The resource is, is they're both good fun actually this week. The resource is called Sarah's Inbox, and uh, it is a project of the Sunlight Foundation. And what it has done is give a nice uh, sort of Google Gmail looking interface. And I know they've done this before and I'm trying, I know we've featured it before too as a resource awesome. of the week, somebody else's inbox um, where uh, what happens is, you know, uh, public people such as the governor of Alaska uh, have their emails while in office uh, as a matter of public record. And these digitized emails have been uh, released by ProPublica and MSNBC.com and Mother Jones and other sources. And uh, they've been purchased and collected and printed and scanned and all sorts of stuff, but they weren't that easy to search. So public knowledge, or I'm sorry, the Sunlight Foundation has done the, uh, the final step of making these emails of Governor Palin searchable. And so, you know, if there's anything that you want to research in looking into uh, this uh, possible soon to be presidential candidate and her turn as governor. Uh, her email record is there for you to check out. It's at sarahsinbox.com. And my particular favorite thing about this are the sample searches that the Sun Sunlight <laughs> Foundation has put up. Uh, all one word, flip and believe it. Bridge to nowhere, Tina Fey. Horrible people are bringing you down. Alaska natural gas pipeline, that one's rather more uh, sensible. Barack Obama, crud, first dude, who leaked it? What a dumbass he is. Who's going to trim my hair and pizza? <laughs> so <laughs> if you want to search those things or anything else you can think of in Sarah's inbox, it's there uh, at your disposal, thanks to the Sunlight Foundation. And our tip of the week is, is one we frequently have, that crime in the internet era is getting more and more difficult, this time uh, up in Canada. Evan, you want to enlighten us about this? Well, sure. As we are you know, well aware now, um, the uh, Boston Bruins beat the Canucks, you know, out of Vancouver. Uh, what was that? When, night before last, Wednesday night. And, you know, there were these terrible riots up there in, in Vancouver. Uh, this was for the Stanley Cup finals. Um, and, you know, we, you know, it's not the first time there have been riots, obviously. That's kind of as much as our American history as 
you know, what you, you name it, uh, you name the Americana there. But, um, you know, this seemed to really be, wait, wait, actually, this is Canada. So I don't know, maybe riots haven't been a part of Canada. Who knows? Um, huh. There were these terrible riots in Vancouver, and uh, Wednesday night, uh, I was on Twitter, and I saw uh, someone post a link to a couple of things. There was a Tumblr account, and there's, you know, that's vancityriotcriminals.tumblr.com, and then there was a Facebook page set up. Both of these things, their purpose was to for, to have people uh, submit, to send in the photos they had taken during these riots, you know, people going around smashing windows, turning over cars, setting cop cars on fire, you know, assaulting uh, other people. I mean, terrible, terrible riots. And, you know, it really has made Vancouver look bad and it's gotten its... Um, you know, it's been run through the mud in, in the mainstream media. But what is just really fascinating about this and what really gives perspective and insight into all this are the ways that uh, social media has permitted the distribution of information about this that has at least two very obvious practical purposes. One, to make this stuff known. Uh, you know, I, you know, it gave me insomnia on Wednesday night. I was staying up until the wee hours of the morning, just hitting refresh on this Tumblr page, looking at the new photos that were coming in. The people were taking of this looting and rioting, uh, you know, with their mobile devices and, and making available. And, you know, the other um, uh, benefit from this is, you know, this is a place where law enforcement can go uh, and cooperate in cooperation and collaboration with various users to try to identify who these uh, criminals are. I mean, it's, this, is, it, it, this is just so fascinating, this, this side of the, the human soul, the human psyche that, will, uh, that, that underlies, you know, mob action to see these, you know, how crazy people are acting. You know, there's a picture of a guy, you can, he's clearly identifiable. He's got the match to the, you know, he's got a, like a rag or something stuck into the um, gas tank of the cop car and he's setting it on fire. I mean, that dude is not going to have a defense. Uh, when you know that that photo is shown in court, I mean that's the understatement of the of the day right there, and that's just countless one of countless examples. I mean there are a lot of screenshots from people's Facebook page. One guy, this I mean I'm not I'm not uh, violating any rights by saying this guy named Brock Anton, you know, idiot of the year here. You know, by he ha there was a screenshot from his Facebook page where he was just talking about how he'd broken all these fingers and he was, um, you know. Uh, beating up pigs, you know, talking about the cops and all that stuff. I mean, th there are scores of these examples. So this is just the most poignant example. It just shows us how widely distributed all of these means of gathering and sharing information are and how in a, in a real critical instance like this, this stuff can unfold and this information can be radically distributed essentially in, in real time. And, uh, you know, it was a terrible thing that happened, but it was fascinating to, to watch this uh, on Wednesday night. And, you know, and since then, more and more content is, is coming up there. So the tip of the week is to, uh, well, don't be an idiot, but especially don't yeah. be an idiot when there are hundreds of people uh, around you with uh, mobile devices and access to their social media accounts. But, so let me ask you a question, because I, I think this goes, you know, the UK has these surveillance cameras, these CCTV cameras everywhere, right? Do you think there's like a, is, that, is there enough of a deterrent effect, right? I mean, you're saying, well, don't be an idiot because everybody has a cell phone camera. But yeah, you can just I mean. So they say, don't be an idiot because there's 10,000 CCTV cameras all through our city. I mean, is there enough of a deterrent effect to say the government should put up all these cameras? This becomes a different kind of situation because it, it seems like there is, n there is no real practically effective deterrent when it comes to this. I mean, because these are heinous crimes that people are committing, terrible felonies that could put some of them in jail for the rest of their lives. But they're doing it, and there are literally, literally hundreds of people around them. And, and so that's the thing that's so interesting to me is the, the lack of any kind of real effectiveness that this, um, that this distributed big brother kind of vector, or I, I don't know how to exactly articulate it, but it's the, it's the idea that, you know, the big brother is, is operating not so much from the government, but we're all narking on each other, so to speak, with all these photos that we're I uploading and sharing. You, we are stuff. the government for the people, <laughs> by the people. You don't listen to me. I got to go. I got I have a socialist rally to attend. <laughs> yes, just don't light any cars on fire while you're there. <laughs> And I think it's kind of no, ironic that serious. we've got this, uh, this, you know, our point here is that in, in the age of cameras everywhere and, you know, people who have access to Tumblr, et cetera, you're not going to be able to commit a crime like this and, and have it go undetected.
but it's the same tools that allow organizations like LulzSec and Anonymous to, to do all their activities without getting yeah. caught. I guess when all the key loggers and uh, front facing cameras are flipped on and recording yeah. every single move we every make. Every cell phone from now on will ship yeah. with a key logger and that will be provide an effective deterrent to LulzSec. That'll be it. Now, you know, this is, you know, these are questions of like fundamental, like evidentiary relevance, right? It's, this is why we have hearsay laws and this is why we, we rely on eyewitness testimony, but we know that that's inherently unreliable in a lot of cases, right? This is, you can commit a crime in front of a hundred people and get a hundred different stories. You cannot commit a crime in front of a hundred cameras and get a hundred different pictures. And that's, that's the shift. I think ultimately that's the shift is, you know, tomorrow comes and everybody has a photo and that's a, that's a whole different world than we're accustomed to living. Yeah. Right. And then what, what's more, these people, these, these idiots, I mean, I'm just going to say it, you know, go on and brag about it on their own uh, accounts. That's the thing that, that adds stupidity on top of stupidity. Yeah. It's hard to throw in the Photoshop defense when you've done that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it was a mistake. It was a DM fail. That's not, that's not actually my stuff. I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> All right. Well, be careful out there in your DMs and everything else you're doing, folks. Uh, with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of This Week in Law. Thank you so much, Neelai, for coming back on. Hey, I love being here. I love nerding out with you guys anytime. Love nerding out with you, too. Uh, find Neelai at thisismynext.com. Catch his podcast later today and uh, also at Reckless on Twitter. Yeah, thanks, guys. You're welcome. And Evan, great show again. Great chatting with you. Yes, for sure. It's always it's always good. And you know, just another shout out to Neli. This is my next is is great. I've I've really enjoyed mm -hmm. reading that. I'm so happy you guys are, are writing over there. You guys have really uh you've really raised the bar when it comes to, to good reporting on stuff. So that's that's awesome. I really appreciate your work at uh this is my next dot com. Well thanks, man. You know, yeah, it's just our it's our interim site. You know, give us the end, you know, beginning of fall, sort of there. We're gonna launch the full thing. We we have some big news coming, I think next couple months. So, so thank you very much. We're, we're working very hard, but I assure you a real site will not be a WordPress blog with a $49 theme. I, I it, promise. It should be, you know, why not? <laughs> Google kept Gmail in beta for what, seven years or something. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it gives you a great sort of sandbox feel to things that are going on there. So it's great. Yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, I appreciate the compliments. It's, it's been really gratifying to see people respond to what we're doing over there. And I promise we're, we're going to, we're going to try to live up to the hype. We're, we're going to do our very best. But thank you very much. Right on. Oh, cool. All right. So uh, find Evan between the shows over at internetcases.com and he's Internet Cases on Twitter. You can find me between the shows uh, by emailing me. I'm Denise at twit.tv. I love to hear from you guys. You can leave comments on the shows over at bagandbaggage.com where I post them. And uh, what else? We've got a Facebook page you should go check out at uh, facebook.com slash thisweekinlaw, where people are so wonderful in posting up things that we should be sure not to uh, miss during the week. And we also try and have some discussions about things we're going to talk about on the show. So find us there and find us next week at 11 Pacific, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. We'll be here recording then. We hope to see you. Bye-bye.